Hi everyone, it's Mark again with Word of Faith Fellowship and I'm glad you're listening. Today I want to pick back up on the subject of how the devil masquerades as an angel of light to deceive God's people. So we've been doing a series when I've been on this radio program covering different areas uh, that have been coming into the church that Christians and people who claim to be Christians have been doing. And so uh, some of the things we've been covering is martial arts, uh, we've been covering tattoos, yoga, acupuncture, and talking about how demonic all of these things are and how the devil is trying to use them and come into the church to pull God's people away from what is truth and what is holy living before God. And so today we're going to pick back up and we're going to cover the Masons. Now, some of you may have not heard of that, and some of you may have, and some of you have may, may have been in the Masons or are in the Masons, but I believe that God will show you, as we go through this very clearly, how demonic the Masons are. And you may know people in it. Uh, sometimes uh, it, it's a lot of older generation people that have been in it. Uh, you may know your grandfather that was in it. And so we'll cover the Masons. And as we go through this, uh, I encourage you just to have an open heart and listen uh, let God speak to your heart as God has convicted my heart about this. And then uh, if you know somebody that's in the Masons, you can pray for them. And if God has you share with them, then you can share with them. So here is where we'll start. Uh, I want to start off with uh, focusing on an author, John Salsa. Uh, John Salsa was a Mason, and he's actually a practicing attorney currently. He's also a Catholic, and so he was involved in the Masons, and he ended up being very convicted by the Holy Spirit that what he was involved with it was not God, that it was actually against God. And so he wrote a book on it, and the, he wrote actually several books on it. One of the books is Masonry Unmasked, and the other book is Why Catholics cannot be Masons. And so he goes through and takes each part of the Mason beliefs, the practices, and then he puts it up against the Bible and he points out why you cannot be a Mason if you are a Bible-believing person. Uh, and so we're going to go through his book and portions of it because he makes it very clear. And then we're going to, if we have time, we're going to pick back up on uh, another person who wrote a book, and his name is Michael Witkoff, and he also was involved in the Masons. Uh, he worked his way up in the in the uh, Freemasons, and then God came to him miraculously, miraculously convicted his heart, and he ended up writing a book uh, entitled "On the Masons and Their Lies: What Christians Should Know About the Masons." And he also is uh, actually he's an Orthodox Christian, but he compared the Mason practice to the Bible and, and even went and did a lot of research on the early authors uh, that, that wrote about the Masons. And so we're going to dive right in. So what I want to first point out is, is that the Masons, uh, most people uh, point to the beginning of the Masons being uh, an actual society of, of Mason builders. These were people in Europe who built the cathedrals and stone masons and so forth. And so this is this is a, a very accepted belief among the Masons uh, that that is the origin. The origin was a group of uh, actual Masons that were doing stonework and they uh, back then they it, sort of a quasi union back then they all got together and they met and they maybe shared their uh, you know trades and so forth and so eventually the thing became popular the group and it uh, allowed merchants to come in business people and then philosophers and then at some point uh, they the very accepted date is uh, June of 1717 uh, that is when there was the formation of the Grand Lodge uh, in England and so when when there was this uh, uniting of business people and philosophers with with the, the Masons uh, it, it it took on a whole new structure and we're going to talk about that and there was it, it took on a structure of philosophy uh, and really became a religion now, in the 1700s, that also what was going on in Europe was the Enlightenment period. Now, you can study this yourself and you'll find out that the Enlightenment period uh, was a time when there was a, a, just an enormous uh, focus on human reasoning. 
Uh, in a sense, there was a, a, a revolt against the church and against God's word. And, uh, and actually, John Salsa writes about this because he, he, he traces a lot of the Enlightenment uh, thought process into the current Freemason uh, doctrine. And what he writes is that the Masonry believes that all men are saved, uh, was influenced by the Enlightenment period in the late 18th century. Okay, and Enlightenment thinkers pursued the knowledge of God solely through the rational study of nature. Man was to use his intellect to determine the truth that he would follow. While these rationalists maintain a generic faith in God, they discarded the revealed truths that were in God's Word. And here's another point that uh, you can actually find out yourself. Here's a theme of the Enlightenment. Reason is the chief source of human knowledge. God is replaced with knowledge. And so there's this concept as the uh, Masons were growing uh, and you had the philosophers joining, was this concept from the Enlightenment that you can actually reach God through your mind, through, through reason. Reason was taking the place of God's divine word, depending on the Holy Spirit, and, and you can reason through uh, science to, to find God. And so that is so, sort of the, the basis of the formation of this. Uh, and so in society today, uh, they use the word lodge. You may have seen different lodges in your area. And then they have what's called the Grand Lodges, which each state has one. There's In the United States, there's actually 51 Grand Lodges. And so each lodge is set up with an uh, authority-type structure. And so the head of each lodge is called the Worshipful Master. And so there is an actual Mace, Masonic Bible. And this Bible holds the principles and the, and the, and the philosophies uh, and really religion of the Masons. You can actually find these Masonic Bibles on Amazon and you will see that uh, it is absolutely filled with demonic antichrist uh, statements. And so what John Salsa points out is this. He says the Masonic Bible says, quote, by the practice of free masonry, its members may advance their spirituality and mount by the theological ladder from the lodge on earth to the lodge in heaven. Albert Mackey, who's another prominent Masonic author, also says that Freemasonry provides Masons with the means of advancing from earth to heaven, from death to life, from mortal to immortal. Henry Wilson Coyle, Another popular Masonic author says that many Masons get to heaven with, quote, no other guarantee of a safe landing than their belief in the religion of free masonry. Free masonry advances the spirituality of its members through its secret morals and doctrinal teachings, which are symbolized by the working tools of the old operative Masons. And these include the square, the compass, the level, the plumb, and the trial. The universal symbol of Freemasonry is the square and the compass. So you may have seen these, uh, the symbol of the masonry, which is a square underneath, a compass on the top, and the letter G. And we'll talk about what the letter G uh, symbolizes. So John Salsa writes about what happened to him when he first became Mason. Now, John Salsa is a, a devoted Catholic and uh, grew up Catholic, and he is a practicing attorney. And he said that as he was practicing law, uh, he was invited to uh, join the Masons. And he went to his uh, bishops there and asked them, and they really didn't understand what the Masons were, and he did not understand. And so there's this initial discussion when when Masons meet with people and try to explain what, what Masonry is. What they say is that it makes good men better. It makes good men better. And so they try to make it as this positive thing, and they talk about how it unites men together, and it, it sounds, everything sounds okay. So John joined this group and he describes his first meeting in becoming uh, what they call a first-degree Mason. And we're going to go through that. But what he found first was that there is, there is actual Masonic temple 
uh, that's the, the other word for lodge, Masonic temple. And every part of it is set up in a religious way. And so what you have initially is you have a first degree Mason, a second degree Mason, and a third degree Mason. So when John came to the Masonic temple to be initiated, he was deemed what's called a candidate. And he describes his experience. And now what John says is in his research is that this is a very common practice. Now, what you should know is this. And if you're listening and maybe you are a member of the Masons, uh, please understand. And John points out in his book, and we're going to read from another author, that, that it is recognized that every lodge does things a little differently. But what John points out is that what, what he's going to articulate, in, what he articulated in this book that I'm going to read is very, very uh, prevalent in the Masons. So, so here's what happens to him. He says that he was escorted to a private room. He is first commanded to lay aside all thought of levity and address his mind to the solemn truths he is about to learn. He is then told to strip down to his underwear. In addition to his clothing, the candidate is required to remove all jewelry, including his wedding ring, crucifix, and any other sacramental that he might be wearing. He later learns that he was divested of his religious reminders so that he might, quote, carry nothing offensive or defensive into the lodge. Now, as I've studied this, and I, I have read uh, several testimonies from different people in other countries, in other parts of the United States, and I've read testimonies of those who were in the Masons and they came out and God dealt with their heart. And what I found was that every one of them said that a procedure that was very similar to this. Now, now some of the procedures were they weren't stripped down to their underclothes. They were actually made to uh, take off the shirt or open, unbutton their shirt uh, to expose their 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 chest, and we'll we'll find out why. But but very similar processes. Now here's what he goes on to say. While some Masons claim that free Masonry encourages a man to practice his own faith, free Masonry actually requires the candidate to divest himself of all reminders of his faith. An an obvious and blatant contradiction of this claim. And he writes that uh, the the. Uh, he writes the very next thing that is ha going to happen to him in the uh, Mason process is he is blindfolded. Now, this, this is a, an, an unusual thing because he's blindfolded and there's actual noose that is tied around his neck. And the rope is six feet long. Uh, and and the, I've, again, I've, I've read this with other people that were involved. And so the six feet represents that when you when you die, you're going to be buried, and you're six feet down. And so there's this symbolism uh, of this process that you're you're yielding, you're giving up everything that you um, that you believe, every part of you, you're divesting of it to join the Masons and accept what they have. Again. If you're a Mason or you've been a Mason, you might have not had all these processes. But I want you to hear as I'm going through this, even if your process was different, I want you to hear it as we go through this, comparing what this is in light of what God says. And so uh, John was brought to a door, and this is the door of the temple, and he was led by a, a, a Mason, and he's blindfolded, and so... He is brought to this door, and the person leading him knocks on the door three times. And then there's a knock on the other side, and the person calls out, Who is this? And he's greeted. Uh, the person leading him says, It is Mr. So-and-so, and he has lived in darkness all his light, life, and he desires to be enlightened. Now, this is, this is really... Uh, important to understand this. It doesn't matter if you are somebody who is a born-again believer, if you are somebody who's a committed Christian. When you are led to that door and you knock on that and and your your person lead you knocks on that door and announces your name and says, This person has been in darkness 
total darkness all of his life. It's basically saying that it doesn't matter if you believe in Jesus Christ. You're still in darkness until you join the, the, the Masons. So even though, John writes, even though the Christian candidate has been baptized into the light of Jesus Christ, therefore receiving sanctifying grace, which is created sharing in the very life of God, um, he goes on and says, Masonry nevertheless declares that he is in a state of spiritual and mystical darkness. The candidate must die to his former life in Christ and be reborn into the new life of the Lodge. It is his initiation into Freemasonry which uh, calls light, which brings him into the light. Now, we know in the Bible uh, that it's very clear that uh, Jesus talked about the light. And here's what he says. He says, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The light comes from Jesus Christ and no other. And he says that there is no darkness in him. So at John writes, after the declaration of his spiritual darkness, the blindfolded candidate is conducted into the lodge room. After only a few steps, the senior deacon presses a knife or other sharp tool into the candidate's bare breast and declares, on this, your first admission into a lodge of free and accepted masons, you are received on the point of a sharp instrument piercing your naked left breast, which is to teach you that as this is an instrument of torture to your flesh, so should the recollection of it be to your conscience. Should you ever presume to reveal the secrets of free masonry unlawfully? So he writes on, that the next step is this. The candidate is then conducted to the center of the lodge room and made to kneel. At this time, the candidate hears Freemasonry's petitions to the grand architect of the universe. While Christians are to pray in the name of Jesus, Freemasonry deliberately omits Jesus' name from its prayers, as it calls upon the deity as the grand architect, and by other similar titles, in this way the Lodge conditions its members to view God according to the Masonic worldview as the deity of, an, of any and every religious faith. Even though Jesus' name is above every name that is named, Ephesians 1.21. Masonry calls God the nameless one of a hundred names and states that no matter how we pray, we are, quote, yet praying to the one God and Father of all, end of quote. As Masonic author Manly Hall explains, to the true Mason, Christ, Buddha, or Muhammad, the name means little. Thus, Freemasonry denies that Jesus Christ is the one true God and the one mediator of God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a redemption for all. And that's 1 Timothy 2, 5, 6. And, so, and also what you should know is that when you join the Freemasons, there's only, there's only two requirements. One is that you have to be an adult male, and the other requirement is that you have to believe in a supreme being. You have to believe in a deity. So there's only one group of people that are not allowed, and that is if you're an atheist uh, or perhaps an agnostic. But you, if, if you are a, if you are a uh, Muslim, uh, a Buddhist, a uh, Hindu, if you are a Satanist, you can join the Masons. And you all come together, and so... You're together in this temple and you're supposed to basically um, lay aside that your religion is the supreme religion so that you can join with everybody else into the Masonic beliefs. So as you're in there, there's this prayer that's going on to what they call the great architect. Now, I, as I've studied this, I've seen this with everybody that has attested to this, that they actually pray in these temples and they actually invoke the great architect. So uh, John Salsa continues to write, Freemasonry has not only in its own names, it not only has its own names for God, but it also has symbols for God. 
As we have already mentioned, one of these symbols is the letter G, which stands for both God and geometry. The letter G hangs in the eastern quadrant of the lodge room above the chair of the worshipful master. The newly made mason is directed to the letter G once his hoodwink is removed. The Masonic Bible says that the letter G represents the great God of all Freemasons. Thus, in the fellow craft degree, uh, all Masons bow and worship before the letter G. As Manley Hall explains, a true Mason is the one who worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in temple, mosque, or cathedral, realizing the oneness of all spiritual truth. John continues to write, Another of masonry symbols for God is the all-seeing eye, which has clear connections to enlightenment, deism, enlightenment, deism. Deists, like all rationalists, reject revealed truth and religious authority in favor of intellectual speculation about God. Deists view God as the all-seeing eye, who, after creating the world, no longer takes an active role in its course. Coyle claims that uh, the all-seeing eye was used by the pagan Egyptians to represent the god Osiris. Now, you can look this up as I did. The all-seeing eye uh, is a, in reference to uh, an Egyptian god. Now, you also see the all-seeing eye, interestingly, on our dollar bill. Uh, and it's also on some government seals. It's right there in the pyramid. Now, it, also interestingly, um, George Washington was a Mason. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was a Mason. Thomas Jefferson was a Mason. Remember, this is the 1700s. Uh, and, and remember, there's this belief. You can reference God. We have God in our, our, our documents, in, our, in the Founding Fathers' draftings. Uh, but you are not supposed to elevate your religion above others. And so in some of these um, Masonic temples, you also have the all-seeing eye. Uh, that is there listed. Uh, masonry uses use of the letter G and the all-seeing eye facilitates its synchristic understanding of deity. This is the deliberate blending of different beliefs or practices without regard to their compatibility with Christian truth. This is the logical consequ consequence of indifferentism for all religions are equal there is no problem with mingling them. So that is, in essence, what the Masonic Bible uh, promotes, is that all religions are equal. There's no absolute truth. There's no um, that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the only way, as it says in the book of John, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through him. Uh, I mean, there's so many scriptures that talk about this in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. And there is salvation in and through no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Ephesians 2, 8, For you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. John chapter 3, Unless a person is born again, he cannot ever see uh, the kingdom of God. And so, and, and we also know that the Bible is very clear. In Galatians 1 9 that if anyone preaches another gospel let him be accursed that means let God's judgment be on him so John continues to write in the in the final analysis the grand architect of the universe of the Masonic Lodge is not the Holy Trinity and therefore it is a false God thus masonry's teachings and practices are an abomination before the one true God the Father the Son and the Holy Ghost as revealed by Jesus Christ and he quotes, he quotes 1 Corinthians 8, 5, and 6. Yet to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we unto him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all are things, and we by him. Now John continues to write as he's going through this process of his initiation. After the worshipful master prays to the grand architect of the universe, he places his hand upon the kneeling candidate's head and asks, In whom do you put your trust? If the candidate responds with a profession of faith in any supreme deity, the worshipful master declares to him, Your trust, being in God, your faith is well-founded. Arise, follow your conductor, 
and fear no danger. Now this is, again, this is actually like, a, literally like a play. I mean, people memorize lines. They actually tell the candidate what lines to say, the worship. And it's interesting, the title used here is Worshipful Master. I mean, that should be enough to, to be a major alert for any Christian. Now, this is very important that the Worshipful Master asks this question to every candidate. With whom do you put your trust? And you're supposed to put say what your religion is. Realize that any religion you say, I mean, if you say Allah, if you say Buddha, whatever you say, the, the, the worshipful master responds the same way. Here's what he says. He says, your trust being in God, your faith is well-founded. That's not what we just read in God's word. Your faith is not well-founded unless you have your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. And so John continues to write, no matter what God the candidate professes, masonry assures him that his trust is in God and his faith is well-founded. After the candidate professes his faith, he is conducted around the lodge room. He is then instructed to approach the Masonic altar, which masonry calls a place of sacrifice. As the candidate stands blindfolded before the altar, the worshipful master informs him that he is required to take a solemn and binding oath. The worshipful master assures the candidate that there is nothing in the oath that will conflict uh, with his belief in God. And so let's look at these oaths, okay? And it's interesting, uh, John writes, the term place of sacrifice is very appropriate because the candidate at the altar swears by blood oaths and sacrifices his former religious faith for the new religion, faith in Freemasonry. In each of the three Masonic oaths, the candidate swears he will conform his life to the teachings of Masonry, Freemasonry. Now, here we go. I, I was shocked when I found these. The candidate swears never to reveal Masonry secrets to profanes. The candidate also swears a curse upon himself that he would be worthy of a grisly death if he ever violated his oath. For example, the candidate swears that he would be worthy of, quote, of having my throat cut across, my tongue torn out, and with my body buried into the sands of the sea, of having my left breast torn open, my heart plucked out, and placed on the highest pinnacle of the temple, of having my body severed in twain, my bowels taken thence and burned to ashes, the ashes scattered to the four winds of the heavens, of having my eyeballs pierced to the center with a, with a three-inch blade, my feet flayed, and forced to walk in hot sands. Uh, th this is so against God. We're, we're supposed to have our allegiance to God and God alone. And so uh, I'm almost out of time, but I want to point out to you this, that at the very end of the process, as John goes through it, he says that he's asked the question, what do you desire most? And you're supposed to say light, and then the blindfold is removed. Well, we know that light comes only in Jesus Christ. It doesn't come through Masonic processes. What I want to do is this. I want to encourage you, uh, if you have ever been involved in the Masons, if you know anybody involved in the Masons, I want to encourage you to, 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 to those you know, pray for them. If you're involved or if you have been involved, pray and ask God to, to uproot anything that would still be in your heart with these oaths. The Bible is so clear that, that we are to, to fellowship with God's people. They, they, they front that this is acts of kindness and goodness, but that is to be done through the church. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not make mismated alliances with them or come under a different yoke with them inconsistent with your faith for what partnership have right living and right standing with God with iniquity and lawlessness or how can light have fellowship with darkness so this so the devil comes masquerades as light and says that this is going to be a way you can do good works but God throughout the Bible uses the church the church is the vehicle that God uses in Ephesians chapter 4 it declares that the church is how we're going to be more transformed into the likeness of God it says do not forsake the church and here it says, do not fellowship with unbelievers. So why would you join yourself, if you're a true believer, to other gods, other people who are practicing gods? Why would you submit yourself to these demonic oaths and take on these practices when God has made the way through his church for you to fellowship with the believers and for you to carry out the works of God and his teachings that God has ordained through the body of Christ? And so I just want to encourage you today, go to God. And ask God to show you. We've been in this series 
And as it says in Romans 14, verse 23, whatever does not originate and proceed from faith is sin. So ask God to show you anything in my life that does not originate from you, God. I want it out. Thank you for listening. Uh, again, this is Word of Faith Fellowship radio program. We're on this program Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, 8.30 to 9. And you can go to our website and see all of our past radio pro programs. They're videoed. Our website is wordoffaithfellowship.org. Thank you very much.